Thank you all for standing by, and welcome to the first webinar of our fall series entitled Regional Impacts of Climate Change on Forests and Bird Communities. These webinars are an initiative of the Ohio State University Climate Change Outreach Team, a multi-departmental effort within the university led by OSU Extension, Ohio Sea Grant, Bird Polar Research Center, and six other OSU departments to help localize the climate change issue for Ohioans and Great Lakes residents. I am Jill Gentis Benicki from Ohio Sea Grant and Stone Laboratory, and joining me today is Dr. Steve Matthews from Ohio State University. Dr. Matthews is a, re a research assistant professor in the School of Environment and Natural Resources and a landscape ecologist for the U.S. Forest Service. His research focuses on understanding how ecological systems respond in a changing world. In addition to his field studies in wildlife ecology, the majority of his research centers on modeling the habitat dynamics of tree and bird species distributions to climate change across the eastern United States. We're delighted to have Dr. Matthews here today to discuss how a changing climate could affect our bird and tree communities. But before we do that, a few logistical issues as we get started. During our presentation, all participants will be in a listen-only mode. Afterwards, at about 1240, we will conduct a question and answer session. If you would like to ask a question during the presentation, please feel free to use the chat feature located on the right-hand side of your screen, and I'll collect and pose your questions out to Dr. Matthews at the end of his presentation. We have uh, more than 100 participants on this webinar, a great diverse group representing governmental agencies, academia, and nonprofit groups from the Great Lakes and around the country. Please keep those questions coming throughout the presentation, and we should have a great Q&A session. As a reminder, this webinar is being recorded and will be posted onto our website for later viewing. Also, we will post a webinar survey in the chat feature toward the end of the hour. Please take a few minutes after the webinar to fill out that survey. It will help us continue to bring you better webinars. So without any further delay, I'd like to introduce Dr. Steve Matthews from Ohio State University, who will pre be presenting regional impacts of climate change on forests and bird communities. Let me just unmute you, Dr. Matthews. All right, oh. there you go. All right. Well, thank you very much, Jill. I, I really appreciate the invitation uh, to talk today, and thanks to everyone for, for joining us. Um, I think we need to get back to the start here. We were doing a little testing before, so let's just jump back up to the start. Um, so I'll just go ahead and get started, and I really look forward to the Q&A session um, at the end so I can answer any of your questions um, that come up as, we, as, I, as I present today. Before I begin, I, I want to acknowledge the co-authors, uh, Lewis, uh, Lewis Iverson, Natha Prasad, and Matt Peters, um, who we've been working together for quite some time now on these questions of, of climate change impacts. And so our landscape change um, research group is, has really been focusing on, on the questions of how bird and tree species habitats may change moving forward. Um, so just to, to begin, I um, would like to go over the um, kind of the, the topic for today. Um, we'll be talking about um, the, the fact that climate is changing and how species are responding. And, um, and then with that knowledge, the, the challenges that apply to conservation and management, um, if, we don't, if we ignore those um, realities, then those uh, measures will likely fail. And then because it's a, such a, a complicated realm, you know, how can we integrate the, our understanding of how species may respond to climate change um, within those frameworks. And to do this, it, it really requires um, building on uh, your work in stages. So in this case, we'll be talking about very broad scale um, species distribution models, which is a logical start, and then moving down, working with managers um, to actually get these um, results um, applied to the ground. Um, so just to begin, just to, you know, I'd like to always start off with, you know, instead of thinking about how um, climates and species are, are likely to change with climate change, I think it's important to, to start off with just acknowledging that we are seeing um, shifts in contemporary um, climate systems. Um, this is from 2009 uh, NOAA report and these 11 indicate, indicators um, suggesting um, how climate is already been changing. So whether it's land temperatures or um, sea level or sea temperatures or snow cover, um, those all are pointing in the direction um, of a changing world. 
and and with that, um, we we are starting to see phenological changes as well as distributional changes in vertebrate species. So if we can take the example of amphibians um, calling uh, a week and a half to two weeks earlier in in New York um, for half of the species that were investigated. Um, in this case, the wood frog um, calling 13 days earlier than it did in the early 1910s. And then if we turn to the to the bird side, um, earlier arrival times, and that's in Australia. Um, and then, of course, all of the, the evidence from birds hatching earlier and all the great work um, conducted in Europe. And that's this, that, this figure four from the paper in Global Change Biology, um, which really what we're, which we're seeing um, is just two time periods here, um, the 90s to 2000, 1980 to 84, and then this, this earlier hatching date period. And of course, when we have these changes in phenology, um, they can potentially lead towards mismatches in, in timing, um, in which we would see a disruption in kind of the, the uh, timing of individuals, uh, whether it's a food resource or, or a nesting substrate. And so, and you know, as we talked about those phenological changes, we're also beginning to, to identify and document ch changes in species distributions. Um, in this case, for mammals in um, Michigan, over you know from the from the 1880s to the 2006 period, um, looking at eight primarily mammals um, within the area, and documenting um, just changes in distribution within those important uh, small mammal communities. Of course, there's a lot of other things occurring in such a long time period, um, but the signal of climate is certainly suggested by those results. And also on the bird side of things within North America, again, um, we see the, the changes in winter range of a northerly shift in uh, distribution for species. Of course, some species are, with, are showing shifts north, some shifts south, but in terms of the overall average, um, a, a positive um, increase northward. Um, and then we also see a similar trend in, in, in the breeding ranges of birds as well over, over the 30-year period. And so what do we mean we, now we have kind of set up a baseline to thinking about um, how species are showing um, changes um, in contemporary conditions, how may they change moving forward? And to do that, it's going to be highly tied to the levels of CO2 um, emissions for the most part. And we can certainly use the, the, the great work in climate modeling um, to get an idea of how temperatures may change and precipitation patterns. Um, this is an example from the northeastern US um, as we diverge from the 2000s to the end of century. And for those interested, the, the emission scenarios that we're using are the emissions um, storylines, or the high emissions are A1FI, and the lower emissions are, are B1, and using uh, three different climate models for that. Um, and we see just within the northeast the potential for very large shifts in temperature, um, and more so under a high emissions or a more um, CO2 intensive scenario, as opposed to the lower emissions, which would mention imply some higher levels of conservation. And so not, it's not just temperature changes, but also changes um, and the combination of changes in temperature and precipitation. Um, so in this case, uh, we take the northern Wisconsin example, because I'll be providing an example of some work we've been doing there. Um, if we talk, start off at current conditions, long-term temperature averages, um, this is a growing season temperature, so May to September, um, under a high emissions, A1FI again, in the Hadley CM3 model, we have a, a, a marked potential for increases in temperature. And under the PCM model with the low emissions, um, again, a, a potential increase in temperature, but not nearly as much. And when you couple those changes in temperature with um, potential changes in precipitation during that same growing season period from May to September, um, don't see as much of a change in precipitation. And, and this could start to suggest um, you have more physiological stress on biota um, if those temperatures and precipitations are not necessarily, they, they become desynchronized. And so this all leads to, to some great opportunities, but we, we can't really move forward without acknowledging the challenges that, 
are, are put forth by trying to model species distributions and back to the climate. First off, we have to we have to deal with and understand the, the great variation there, there are in the climate models in the GCM variation. And these are ultimately tied to um, the uncertainties around the productions of CO2 moving forward. And then when we get to the species side of that, if we can, if we can grapple around with you know, our uncertainty about how the climate may change, we have to also um, be, recognize that you know, the species biologies and interactions moving into novel spaces are, are again, uncertain. And that poses a challenge for validation moving forward. But nevertheless, I mean, the bottom line is we really we can't wait, as that initial um, citation by Lawler and also some great citations by um, Weens have suggested. You know, waiting isn't necessarily an option, and and we have to move forward. And modeling is a, a great tool that gives us the ability to look at different scenarios of how species may respond to climate change. And so that's really what has led our um, our thinking and our approach to how we're modeling species distribution. And while this may look like a busy slide, um, I think hopefully I can walk you through it quite quickly. Um, basically, our, all of our models are data driven. So we start off with a, a large amount of landscape data. In the case of tree species, which would be um, derived from the forest inventory analysis data, the breeding bird incidence data, which would come from the breeding bird survey. We have climate, environmental data, which would include soil and forest types. Um, and that goes into our modeling of the species distribution, which we'll be talking about a bit. It's also important to acknowledge that taking a multi-stage approach is really important with such uncertainties. And so we also have to think about for trees, um, how um, their ability to, to shift and potentially move into these new habitats will be hampered by their dispersal abilities, as well as time lags. And then we also have to recognize there are many un um, unmodeled biological processes, how the species respond to disturbances and, and their biological characteristics that we have to consider if we're eventually going to get to a point um, where we can, or these results can be informative to managers. And so what I would like to talk to you about is some of the rationale that went into our bird models and, and, and then show some results as we move towards um, making informed management decisions. So for birds, the role of climate is, is clear in shaping the distributions. Um, it can be linked to the species um, metabolic rates um, being a threshold at which um, species you know, can't occur. It becomes too metabolically costly. We can also look at broad patterns of species richness, so the numbers of species occurring in a given location and the relationship with the potential of effort transpiration, or PET. So that's, again, incorporating um, uh, precipitation amounts as well as solar radiation. Um, and so as you can see for birds, uh, a very tight association with evapotranspiration. transpiration. So, so it is clear that climate does play a large role in shaping where species occur on the landscape. Um, but we can't ignore that there's also a strong habitat component. So these two forest birds uh, clearly would would be moving over towards the, the picture on the right of the nice forested landscape in Maine, as opposed to, unfortunately, being in an agricultural field surrounding Columbus, Ohio. It's just the reality of you know, where species are, are present. And, and therefore, when we were deciding and thinking about how we can go about modeling species distributions, it was important to incorporate climate as well as um, some habitat variables on the ground. So in our case, individual tree species as potential predictors. And so it's important before we kind of get into some of the results that we always keep in mind that we're modeling suitable habitat, not necessarily where the species will be by the end of the century. And then again, with our distribution models, um, we're not necessarily taking into account these biological interactions and human and natural disturbances. Um, but we still can learn quite a bit from these individual models, especially looking at individually um, for any species or combining the results across species. So this is just a, a shot of the website and how it looks. And we can see a list of species. Um, maybe we can look at individual species results as well as focusing on combined species results. 
And if we just take a quick look at how an individual species page may look like, this is for a uh, sugar maple. And there's a lot of information not only on how their habitats may change under climate change, um, but even their current distribution and the environmental predictors that are most associated with it. So there's some examples of species that are projected to increase in habitat. Um, if we look at the prothonotary warbler, uh, the first thing to note is that the species um, model in terms of reliability, which we which we really like to um, assess and be transparent as, as well as possible on the, the website by showing the variables that are influencing the model, but also that it's acknowledging that some models do better than others at capturing the species' current distribution. So this does a fairly well decent job at capturing the prothonotary warbler's current distribution. And then if we if we swap those climate variables out as well as the tree species variables since we have information on how they may change under different um, climate models and emission scenarios, we can get a picture of how their suitable habitat may change. Now, interestingly enough, for the prothonotary warbler species model, it's a southern species. Um, so an important variable is a, a common southern species of uh, sweet gum. But it's also a bottomland hardwood species. So species such as water oak come important in, in, in describing its distribution, as well as precipitation and climate variables. As another example, we could look at the brown-headed nuthatch. Again, a southern species that is projected to increase in habitat. Um, but with, within its core of its current range, where it can be fairly high, highly abundant, we do see a decrease, um, whether we're talking about the PCM low, so that's kind of our mildest scenario, or a Hadley high, which is our, our harshest model we look at. And it's really important that we look at this variability in the models to understand um, and engage our confidence in the habitat models. And so this question mark here is really referring to um, which emissions pathway um, do we choose, one that's lower or, or one that's higher, and we can see the, the divergence and the results from that. Just to look at examples of some species projected to decrease in habitat, the black thirded blue warbler and northern species, um, its range extending down the Appalachians. Uh, and then under um, climate change, we see its habitat constricting into the higher areas of the Appalachians as well as contracting northwards um, back retreating into Canada, potentially. We don't have data for Canada, so we, we have to just take a, a very eastern US boundary approach here. But again, it's a species we have a higher model reliability for. And another example is a black tap chip, black tap chickadee, um, a, a species, again, rejected to decrease in habitat. Uh, it's interesting to note that the decrease in habitat are are largely within its current range. So we don't see a, a large contraction potential in habitat as we do with the black blue, blue warbler. Um, so it's occupying the same area, just we see a decrease in its incidence uh, or, or habitat suitability. Now, all these data are available on our website. And you'll notice it down here at the bottom. And they'll be at the end of the talk as well. Now, it's important to look at individual species, but really the re results are very informative when you combine them and start looking at for general trends. One thing that we'll note is that um, the Hadley High is our, our more our harsher condition. And under that, that model I'll walk you through here is we see about 50% of the species projecting to decline in habitat by at least 10%. About 38 or so percent of the species are projected to have a at least a 10% increase in habitat. So how, you, how I got that was by looking at this legend here. So it's an incident change. So a ratio of 1 would be a species that does not change its habitat. As that number goes below 1, we have potential for decreases in habitat. And you do see a, a very a wedge shape here. So under a, a milder scenario, you have less of a, a projected change in habitat. And this gives us a good idea of the overall um, changes of a species distribution. We can also look at this mean center, which is looking at the centralized location of the species distribution. And across all of the 147 species, we see a, a, a shift in that core of the species distribution from about 109 kilometers to 212 kilometers. Now, this is predominantly in a north by north um, east direction, but there are some species that show shifts south. And this is, this is all great, and it provides us some great information about species at the distribution level. But when we, when we start talking about making decisions and applying the results, it's often um, more relevant to focus on a specific geographic location. This is some work we are part of with 
Chicago Ecosystem Assessment. And so I pulled out quickly here the distribution of summer tanager um, within this boundary of um, kind of focal on Chicago, so um, getting up into Lake Michigan. So it's presently not, it's a, it is present within the area, but it's not super abundant. Um, the incidence is projected to increase as we move into a, B is a, a lower emissions um, trajectory and, and C is a higher emissions trajectory. And so we can look for individual species and then again patterns across species. So under high emissions we see a, a, of the 130 species are projected to have at least a 10% change with slightly more projected to decline than increase. And that pattern is, is again seen with the low emissions scenario, it's just not as dramatic in numbers. So that gives us a way to start to focus these results and, and start make them more meaningful um, to folks. Now, the big question is, are these data actually being used anywhere? And we can happily say that, you know, yes, they are being used. And we are fortunate enough to be a part of this um, project of um, looking at climate change vulnerability uh, within northern Wisconsin. It was led by Chris Swanson and Maria Janoyak. Um, and they um, put together a great team to start addressing uh, how we can, you know, think about climate change vulnerability and adaption and mitigation. So we are one part of a, this effort in which our tree species data were used in, in generating a report that really tried to look across scales, really incorporate um, managers um, into you know, thinking about what they're currently managing for and, and how these results can be utilized and engaging the broader community. So for this, as I said, our, we are contributing our tree work. So just to give you a quick picture of a sugar maple, um, its projected habitat um, is projected to decline um, either under a lower emissions or high emissions scenario. And then, um, so we have that for each individual tree species. Um, but then, as we know, there are many other factors that are influencing species distributions. Uh, there are biological and disturbance characteristics. And such characteristics as you know, how, how shade tolerant are they? How do they respond to fire? Um, how do they respond to other disturbances? Or how are their, what are their biological capacities? And, and so what we did was we rated the nine biological and 12 disturbance characteristics to look at positive and negative impacts. And so this is all in our modification factors. If you're following the, uh, our approach slide down there at the bottom, and we're kind of in that realm of our, of our research here. Um, and the goal was really to evaluate and to kind of assess more realistic outcomes at regional and local levels. And so these metrics are meant to, to change with, with the unique knowledges that uh, managers have on the ground. And the results were going into a, a multi-criteria framework that can be uh, applied um, in, in, in addition with our habitat change results. So while this looks like a busy slide, hopefully it's, it's fairly clear what we're trying to get across here. What we did was we took those um, disturbance scores, those 12 disturbance characteristics, as well as the 12, as the nine biological characteristics, and we mapped them out for each individual species. So if we take um, the red maple in this case, um, it's a species that's projected habitats are to decline, that's that downward triangle, but its characteristics suggest it's highly adaptable. Um, if we think about the occurrence of red maple within the U.S. and its increase um, with, the, um, with changes in disturbance regimes um, through, the, through time, um, it's a species that is showing to be um, very prolific and growing in many different habitats. And it's very, um, uh, its ability to compete for light and its shade tolerance are advantageous. So, so how this scale works is as we move to that upper right quadrant where red maple is, that in indicates a likely higher adaptability with climate change. Um, the black oak example is a species projected to increase in habitat with our, with our species distribution models. It has a positive modification factor profile, so um, suggesting it may be able to persist in these harsher areas. So it's very tolerant to drought, for example, one factor that's projected to increase um, under climate change. Balsam fir, on the other hand, is a species that's projected to decline in habitat with a downward arrow. Um, it has very negative mod factor modification factor scores. So both the habitat models and the modifications would suggest that it likely face severe limits within the eastern U.S. as we move into the, the middle portions of this century. 
And so for this project, um, so what we did was we pulled on the 73 species that occurred within this ecological provenance 212 of Wisconsin, so the, the, the shaded area um, along this line. Um, we classify those into eight different classes. There's only one species habitat that's projected to um, completely um, disappear from the area, and that's because it's a species that wasn't um, presently very common to begin with. But there are 12 species that are that are fairly common that are projected to have large decreases. And then there are several species that presently do not incur within the area uh, that may have their habitat increased there. And so we combine the habitat results again with the modification scores. To, to build um, the, the, these tables that can be helpful in adopting man adaptive management strategies. So just a quick look at those species in case you want to quickly try to find your favorites. Um, so in species projected to decline, uh, we see sugar maple and balsam fir. Um, and then species that are projected to remain within the area and not change greatly in habitat. And then species projected to um, increase that are currently in the area, that's classes five and six, and then species that presently do not occur in the area, but they may have their habitat um, increase. And so what we can do is we can put these into a table. So this is that class two of the large decreasers. On the left-hand side, we have the projected changes in habitat. So they're all negative because they're all uh, large declining species. And on the right, we can sort it by the modification factor score. And we can see at the bottom there, balsam fir, with its projected decline in habitat, um, aligned with its, um, with, its, with its poor profiles of biological and disturbance characteristics. And then what we also can do um, is we can start to look at species that are already being managed for and already considered important within northern Wisconsin area. So we can look at the total, and we can look at the area that is in balsam fir or in oaks, and we can assess how those habitats um, may change um, in terms of their proportion of the total landscape. So we see declines in in all the cases except for the oak situation, indicating that there's the pressure for a potential shift in the, the forest types within northern Wisconsin as the habitats change. And so a part of this, and, and summarized the results of member, this was a project that included a lot of collaborators. There was a lot of, of work to summarize. And so when the report was being um, was drafted, they came, their, the lead authors were coming up with ecosystem vulnerabilities in this case. And so we look at those, we can get an idea of how they relate to some of the results that I was presenting um, currently. So the lowland hardwood forests, um, those being a um, lot dominated by black ash in the area, um, certainly showed potentials for declines. And this becomes more exacerbated when we think about the threats for emerald ash borer. Um, Lowland coniferous forest, it should be evident hopefully by now that balsam fir has, has um, many potential stresses moving forward. Um, and, and these habitats may continue to decline. And we can see that there are several ecosystems within the area that are already showing decline um, that will likely continue to decline. And these changes, whether they're declines or whether they're increases, um, the vegetations will likely have significant um, effects on wildlife. And as I just alluded to, you know, not all the changes are in a negative direction. Um, many, some species are show a better ability to adapt potentially and accommodate these changes. So species that are currently increasing within the area, um, species that have wider ecological tolerances, um, species that um, that really have the ecosystem that with diverse communities and species. Um, so it's really kind of the putting it together of species projected to decline, species projected to increase in habitat, and then how those community dynamics may play out moving forward. And so. Just to kind of begin to wrap up here, so we can have plenty of time for discussion, um, the modeling framework that we're taking um, to look at 134 um, tree species, 147 bird species, um, in, is, in, is the embedded in our multi-stage modeling framework, and it continues to provide um, novel information about species distributions currently and how they may change moving forward under climate change. Um, 
carry this research forward to look at other components and, make, and really attempt to make the results more relevant to managers. And, and part of this is really to effectively communicate the assumptions that you are, that you are making by generating these models. Um, if we abide by these assumptions, we can start to list species that may be um, increasing within an area or decreasing. And those lists can be evaluated with um, the current um, conditions um, based, based in the area. And then we can also look at how species might get there. A, a big issue when we talk about modeling tree species is that the lag times that occur with, with species' current distributions to areas that they currently do not occupy. So if we just take the quick example of the black oak, its current distribution um, very much straddles that boundary of that um, ecological providence to 12 within Wisconsin. And so if we're thinking about how the species habitat may change within uh, Squamish and Nicolay National Forest, um, there's going to be an implied that the species will be able to, to make it to those areas. And so our, our shift model um, really attempts to address this by looking at the ability of a species um, to disperse into a heterogeneous landscape. And I think we can even see, even though it's a small figure here, um, areas um, where there's more forest, um, where the species range presently is closer to the areas, are likely to be more effective corridors. All areas where there's uh, less forest, this is at a one kilometer scale as opposed to a 20 kilometer pixel where our model works, um, would be less um, likely connected and, and species being able to make it to these areas would be uh, less likely. So that's how we can kind of address the, the discrepancies with a habitat model with the ability of a species to actually um, disperse into a heterogeneous landscape. And then considering the life history characteristics, so that's what I was explaining within the modification factors work. And another important part of that is the ability to um, not only communicate those unmodeled processes, but to also begin to look at the uncertainty around any given projections of a species habitat. So if it's an area where there is high agreement between the three different climate models and, it, and the two emission scenarios, then our confidence certainly is increased about those projected habitats. And then as we move forward is, is really the idea of in, entering an adaptive management framework um, and thinking about how monitoring um, can be utilized to provide um, feedback loops and decisions. Um, we're moving into novel situations. There has to be the expectations of, of being uncertain and uh, being flexible enough to, to make adjustments. If a species habitat is, is projected to increase, but there are other mitigating factors that do not allow for the species to, to occur there, um, that has to be um, recognized. And, and finally, I think just to kind of of the concluding statement is, is really as we're thinking about um, the challenges confronted with um, response to changing um, ecological systems and changing landscape, um, it's really that uh, even at the local level, we think about where we fit within a species distribution. Are we at the core of a species distribution or at the edge of a species distribution? And how those habitats may change um, can give us a, a great amount of information to thinking about how we may plan for a given species within within an area. And with that, I'd like to say thank you and let you know that all of the, the data and maps that we have can be found on our, our websites and there's links to our papers um, discussing these topics. And with that, I would certainly like to open it up to questions. And thanks very much for everyone's attention. Thank you, uh, Dr. Matthews. Um, we have gotten some great questions during the presentation, so let me just get started and ask Dr. Matthews as many as we can. What questions he can't answer today by one, we'll post later on the website with his answers. So let me start off with a few questions, a, a few species questions. Mm -hmm. um, the first one was, um, and this is from one of our Buckeye supporters here, um, are the beloved Buckeye trees moving to Michigan? Oh, it's, it's, it's very hard to remember the um, trajectories of each individual species. Um, it's a species that is, is a little bit more difficult to model um, just because of its, its nature of its distribution, but I believe its habitat is projected to, to increase north. Um, 
So yeah, that would be the answer to that question. All right. Um, what uh, what will some of the most common Great Lakes birds do? Like, could you maybe talk a little bit about a couple of the the most common Great Lakes birds and what will happen to some of those? Um, boy, that's a that's a really tough question to answer. Am I giving you really like, uh, hard questions right at the start? They're not hard. They're they're very um, easy questions. It's just uh, it's just so hard to remember. Um, how all these species are projected to, to change uh, through time um, in terms of their habitats. Um, certainly, you know, sp you know, species that are are kind of um, I show the example of a summer tanager, one that's not common within the, the area that's projected to to increase, um, and then uh, species such as um, chickadees that I showed projected to decline within that region. Um, the paper from 2009 that we worked on with um, Jessica Hellman does provide a list of the top ten decreasers and and increasers um, within that area, and I just I just cannot remember the individual species. So I I will happy to look that up and include that on my online um, answers. Okay, that that sounds that sounds perfectly fine. Um, let me let me ask you a couple questions dealing with specifically some of the modeling. Um, what do you consider what is considered suitable habitat for many of these species? You mentioned suitable ha habitat, and I just wanted to see if you could talk a little bit about what that means. What are the factors that are involved in that? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. That's one I can answer <laughs> certainly a lot easier. Um, so when we're talking about, let's we take the example for tree species. Um, the, those those models are based on you know actual um, on the um, data that collected from forest inventory analysis plots, and so under current conditions, we have a, a good idea of where those species are occurring, and so our models would be relevant to the to the species distribution. And and really what that is, it's a, a continuous variable, so it gives us a, a relative um, index of abundance, so it's based on the basal area and number of stems of, of the species. So that would be a, a metric of abundance. And, and we have a good idea of what that species distribution looks like. But then when we go to into the, um, the future under the climate change projections, well, there we're projecting out of the space of where those data were collected. Um, so we can't, the reason why we say habitat is we can't necessarily say a species will be at location X in the future. All we can say is that the environmental conditions that it currently occurs in um, would be there in the future. Um, and so that would that would be why we call it suitable habitat. And, and for trees, that habitat is made up of climate, soil characteristics, soil properties, um, elevation, and, and just the landscape composition. So that's a, it's a, there's a lot going into what, what make an area suitable habitat. OK. Um, I've got several questions dealing with, um, in modeling, some of the tree species, some tree species questions. Uh, one is um, in modeling the tree species in modeling the tree species distribution. Have you accounted for effects of some of the major forest pests, such as emerald ash borer, um, the Asian longhorn beetle, and others? Right, and so and so for that, um, that's kind of where we adapt that um, multi-stage modeling approach. So the species distribution model um, would not include that. That would just be based on those. Um, environmental um, conditions, um, but that's where we—that's why we really saw a need a couple of years ago to to bring in these modifi modifying factors. And and one of those factors would be its um, with susceptibility to insect pests, susceptibility to disease, as well as um, a host of other components. And so, whenever we model a species, an ash species, for example, and we look at how its habitat is projected to change. Um, there's always a, a large red flag for for um, those in, for those for ammo ash borer reality, and so um, we do we try to you know bring that in um, as that multi um, criteria assessment to say well if habitat is projected to increase for a species that is facing such a threat that would be a species that we would cons that you would be less likely to consider. Um, you know, maybe making some management decision for, um, unless unless it's something that that could be um, controlled in many cases. So it's really just trying to put all the pieces of information together. 
as opposed to directly modeling the multitude of interactions that we don't necessarily have you know, good parameters for. Okay. Um, another question I have is, um, how are soils factored into future tree distribution? Yeah, so the soils, the soils are something that doesn't, um, in, in our case, aren't projected to change. So um, the climate is projected to change, and then the soil characteristics, um, you know, are, are remain static on the landscape. So, so if it's a species that is, let's say, distribution is influenced by the the pH of a soil, um, and so so that model would say. Um, you know, pH is, is contributing to the model. Um, it's important in this model, this amount. And then as you project forward, it's, it would be a place where the climate, um, precipitation, and those soils are, are presently occupied. So it's, it's, it's certainly it's using that soil information. And you see it come up a lot with, let's say, a, a bottomland hardwood species and, and the specific soil types, um, really defining those bottomland hardwood conditions where species would occur. So it can have it can have really important um, local influences on the models, kind of within the distribution, as well as for some very specialist species, even at the distribution level as a whole. Okay. Um, a question uh, we had was, um, what is the smallest scale at which these models are valid to inform management decisions? For example, are these valid at a county level? Yeah, that's and that's a great question, and I probably should have spent a bit more time. Um, so, uh, the models are created at a 20 by um, 20 kilometer pixel. That's 400 um, uh, square kilometers. So that's you know it's pretty large. Um, usually, when we go to interpreting and thinking about what the results would be, we we'd like to have a decent sample of those pixels to make any inference about. So, you know, you know 10 of the pixels, you know, it provides a a good picture of how variable a species um, is within an area. What we do on the web site, we do provide, um, you know, kind of, we do break the country up into um, state, at state level, regions level, and then national forest. Um, but I think for someone who's really interested in, you know, at a county level, if it's a very small county, it's it's more informative to think about, you know, at least a, a neighborhood of pixels. Um, that will give you a much better picture of how the habitat as a whole may be changing, you know, because again, we're we're talking about um, you know fairly broad scale um, processes, and if you have a very unique setting in in your back, you know, 40 or or whatnot, it would not be as represented. But if you think about a group of 10 pixels, you would get a better picture of you know, what the habitats may be for a given species. Okay, um, we have uh, a question dealing with. Um, so about the predicted habitat. Um, one question uh, was from an attendee that asked, regarding the predicted habitat increases for some species, how well do these models include the realities of what the predominant land uses currently are? For example, much of the upper Midwest is in agriculture, and even though uh, habitats may shift, the heavy hand of agriculture and other land uses in many areas may likely stay in place. Yeah, I mean that's and that so the current landscape is is included within the the tree species model. That's one of the predictors. Um, but what we have done with the shift component of the multi-stage modeling is that takes our 20 kilometer pixels and then breaks it down to a a one kilometer um, pixel area. And so if you remember from the one slide that I showed um, in Wisconsin, um, that looked at the potential for, for black oak to, to move through the northern portion of Wisconsin and kind of meet up with the projected suitable habitats for it. And, and in some areas, you see very low um, probability that could colonize areas. And that is directly driven by the amount of agriculture within an area. Um, so that's kind of that's how we we bring in that result. It's you know it's embedded within the models um, as a potential predictor, but then because of that reality and that it's a good point, but asked um, you know we we bring that back in with uh, the shift component to look at you know how colonization you know may be in, inhibited by such that heterogeneous landscape. Okay. Um. <clears throat> 
sorry, I'm going through all these great questions quickly. Um, let me ask you, um, in terms of um, in terms of the the managerial implications for these models, what um, can managers do with the bird atlas information in general? Yeah, well, that's yeah. And so in terms of of, of you know, utilizing the results for one, um, you know, looking at the a list of species as it's projected to to increase or or decline, you know, that gives a good sense of of how those habitats may be shifting, and in doing that in, in light of the model reliability as well. Um, and so if you start thinking about okay, this is my current bird community within a location. You know, how are those species that I'm presently managing for as habitat projected to change? Um, so that becomes a, a great starting point for thinking about what else is currently going on within that uh, landscape or that management unit that I'm doing. And if the species is projected to decline, is there are there other strategies that I could do to, to assist that species? If the species is projected to increase, is is that increase something I would, I would, I would like, and you know what are the other management factors I can use for that? So it's really using the list of species and where you fit within a species distribution, and applying that to the already great knowledge network that you have of the landscape. All right. Um, another uh, question that we had was, um, has there been time enough to test the validity of these models with real species movement? Um, we, we have not necessarily put it, um, you know, into the, into the species movement. Um, there was, you know, some work um, by Chris Woodall looking at the individual, um, looking at the actual forest inventory analysis data from um, different time periods. And I think for um, we had about 40 species in common, and about 37 of them showed a similar trend. Um, that was a paper from a couple of years ago um, that he was presented that in. And so, you know, in the case of not the exact projected changes, but in terms of the pressures of species showing distributions um, more northerly um, seedling distributions than their their larger, um, you know, adult trees, um, we had did have agreement with 37 of those out of those 40 species. You know, so it's not any way validation, but it, it gives us a sense um, of the pressures species, species are facing. And, and then we, we can also link that to, as I was talking about at the beginning of the talk, about the bird distribution movements. We can, you know, that's not um, direct evidence, but it certainly, it provides a, a picture that um, species are responding in a manner consistent with the models in some cases. In some cases, they're not, because there's many other factors influencing you know, why a species um, occurs on landscape. Uh, we have a question from a middle school class, so I wanted to entertain this. Great. Um, what stands out in your mind as the most negative effect on any particular bird species? Um, well, I mean, I think that's. I'm really glad that you're able to listen. I think it's a it's a really great question that can really lead off into you know, long discussions of of you know what factors are influencing and and I will say you know, how you're looking at the at the particular problem. If you're thinking about is it a popul is it a question that you're focused on you know affecting individuals um, you know then you know their food resources and those um, ability to to nest somewhere are, are the main their main concerns, and then when we think about questions at the population level, um, then we get in those you know very fine questions about a, the ability of a species to um, continue on and be successful. Um, it scales up to um, are there habitats for that that group that group of individuals to to maintain. Um, viable populations, and so there we get into the the many factors. You know, is the habitat right? So if it's a forest bird, um, you know, there has to be forest on landscape, but there also has to be a suitable climate for that species to be able to thrive. So I would really say it's it's a hierarchy. So it's a that there's many levels, and at each individual level, they have 
um, unique um, controls of, of why our species occurs. So you know, I would encourage you know, to think about it in that respect, um, moving from the individual up to a population. And you can really see how climate um, change or the climate of an area does and can limit a species um, distribution of how successful it can be. Um, but then as you get down to a finer scale um, into, into you know, areas where the birds are making decisions of how large their territories are, and then they can't necessarily occur there unless those habitats are available for them. So it's really both, which, is, which makes um, ecology complicated but very fun. Great. Um, I have a question dealing with a specific slide of yours. Mm -hmm. um, in an earlier slide, you had uh, Terry Root's uh, T-critical graph with one from Curry um, mm -hmm. from 1991. Could you elaborate on how Curry work adds to or updates or supplements the earlier graph? Oh, well, I, w I was bringing up two, two different points and in some respects. Um, so the one being uh, both demonstrating the the influence or um, how climate um, you know, has been ex used and explains you know, distribution, uh, species distribution bounds in one in case in terms of the metabolic limit. And if it gets too cold, um, a bird just can't, it's just not worth it to put on energy or to sustain energy to, to be able to occur in a landscape. Um, and so that was the point with the the root slide, and and then the other in terms of looking at just broad patterns of of species distributions or of where species are occurring. So that Curry slide looks at species richness uh, across the continental scale, and you really see a a, a close association um, with the, the species richness and potential evapotranspiration or PET, which is really um, derived by the the climate conditions, you know, so it's really taken into account precipitation of value. So it's looking at, you know, these are areas that are, as PET gets higher, these are areas that are producing, um, like it produces higher energy, um, you know, and so more species can persist there. So the point of the slide was really to just illustrate that, you know, climate is influencing species um, at distribution level as well as at the community level when you think about species richness and and you know where more species can occur, um, climate has a a something to say in, in that in that discussion. Okay. Um, one question that we had um, from uh, from Canada was: um, Are you working with Canadian partners to bring a large scale North America wide perspective to the project? Yes, and that's something we've been we've been we've been working on for a long time with um, some of our our colleagues in terms of, and we don't want to do it until we have a good understanding for any data differences, um, and and that's really important to us that we have understanding of the you know, integrity of data that, and that they match. And we aren't influent, imparting any you know, artificial boundaries in terms of how the data were collected. But we have been working closely with um, Canadian friends and. And that's that's a major goal of ours is to increase this work and you know and to to have a more North America perspective when we talk about it because now all we can say is you know the species in the U.S. you know would likely be shifting habitats into Canada and, and that it's something that we are very focused on and, and hope to do and so that's serves extra motivation to get that question and I really appreciate it. Uh, another question that we had was dealing with migratory patterns of birds. How will the traditional bird migratory patterns change with climate change? Um, yeah, I mean, there's, I mean, there's certainly you know, great work looking at migration and, and decisions of migration and, and timing. And so ideas of, you know, if birds are are migrating um, to the breeding grounds, are they going to be able to you know, recognize that there's been you know, phenological shifts, and does that put them at more or less of an advantage? Um, I know from for myself personally, on my PhD work, I, I I was very interested in migration and studied birds by migratory decisions at stopover locations. So it's something that um, it's 
it's a, it's amazing to think about their their links and their their timing um, of migration and and how that all fits together and how it's attuned to resource availability along the migratory route. And I, mean, I know I'm going a little bit off the question here, but you know, I think it's it's something that we can't necessarily address in, in our modeling. Um, but it's it certainly is the focus of other folks who are specifically looking at um, pathways of migration and and how they would likely shift. Um, and, and that and when we think about migration or the process of migration, you also get into the to the realities that you know not talking about climate, but in terms of changes in and weather events can have a pretty big implication if if they're faced with more extreme um, weather days, which I think we'll talk a little bit about in your next webinar, looking more at those extreme precipitation events. Oh, we'll do uh, two more questions. Um, one is, how should private woodlot owners proactively manage for high-value species? Do we need to make woodlot owners aware of these changes, or is it too early? I mean, I, I don't think it's too early to you know to start thinking about you know how species habitats um, may be changing. Um, I didn't get a chance to show it here, but we do um, we do these models in in three different time steps, from you know current and then about 2040, uh, 2070, end of century, and and while the major Changes in habitat aren't occurring until later in the century. For many species, you know, habitats you know are likely already shifting. If you can see, you know, 20 years out, those habitats show evidence that they they may certainly have sh shifted substantially for some species. So, I think it's it's important to, um, you know, one think about as I mentioned before, think about where your woodlot is in relation to a species distribution, and you know, is it an area that's a, a hot spot? Let's say you're in Pennsylvania, and it's um, you have a lot of high-value black cherry. Um, well, in, in that region, black cherry habitat is projected to decline, but it's certainly not projected to disappear. And so maybe there are strategies you could Im imply to keep to keep those on the landscape and and being a valuable commodity. Okay, and the last question that we have time for. Um, do you have any suggestions on how to engage K through 12 teachers and their students in monitoring changes and modeling changes, or engaging in adaptive management processes due to climate change? Yeah, and I think that's and that's that's a a really exciting and and, and great opportunity. I I do know that you know different agencies have, are putting out you know material. Education material. I know the Forest Service has a, a natural inquirer, and they have a climate change edition where they have you know, lesson plans, um, kind of devoted to the to the questions around climate change. And I know, uh, I believe our our some of our research on species distribution models are included in there. And it's really um, you know there are resources out there. That's certainly not the only the one that really try to take some of these. Scientific studies and and distill them down to pull out the salient points um, you know that can be used um, throughout the curriculum of K to 12 um, teaching and and so you know at the level of you know question we had earlier discussing habitat you know what does habitat mean for a species um, you know that's a very valuable uh, lesson to think about um, because that really starts to integrate all the um, Different abiotic factors, and you can get into the biotic components as well. Um, so there, there are resources out there, um, you know, that do try to to present the the results um, as they come from the papers, but in a, a way that you can see the importance of considering ecological systems, and you know, and how they aren't static; they're very dynamic through time. And the species have always been moving around, and and that you know it's important to understand that. Well, thank you. Um, well, actually, we are just about out of time. So um, I wanted to uh, again thank Dr. Matthews for his willingness to talk to us today about Great Lakes bird communities and the impacts that we could face with a changing climate. A really great discussion. Some great questions.
Also, a thank you to NOAA and the National Sea Grant College Program for funding this webinar. I did want to remind you that our uh, survey URL for the webinar is in the chat feature, so please take a few minutes to fill that out. I also wanted to refer you to resources in, the, in an archive of all previous webinar presentations, which are located on our changingclimate.osu.edu website. Uh, this webinar series is sponsored by the OSU Climate Change Outreach Team and will continue next month with a presentation by University of Illinois' Dr. Dave Kristovich, who will be discussing the recent trends of heavy, heavy precipitation that we've been having and how climate change is playing a key role in that. Thank you again to Dr. Matthews and all the participants on this webinar. We hope that this was beneficial and hope you'll join us again in an upcoming webinar. Thank you and have a great afternoon.